Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us to celebrate Public Service Recognition Week. The Partnership for Public Service is proud to be involved in the annual effort to lift up the important work government employees at all levels do to strengthen our nation. We believe that building a better government helps build a stronger democracy. This year, we're celebrating PSRW in a moment that is interesting, challenging, and maybe even a little exciting. We have a government trust gap in this nation. A lack of trust in government isn't exactly new, but in a time when so many of our institutions and traditions have been called into question or even threatened outright, it's all the more troubling. When trust in government erodes, what's really eroding is one of our nation's core foundations. And without that foundation, we risk losing something that binds us all together for a common purpose. Last fall, along with our partners at Friedman Consulting, we asked the public for their views of the federal government. Some of what we learned was alarming. Majorities of adults said they didn't trust the government to do what's right most of the time, that the government has an overall negative impact on the United States, and that the government does not help people like them. If you look at those, just those top lines, it would be easy to draw the conclusion that people don't like government full stop. And you might wonder why during Public Service Recognition Week, we would want to talk about why people don't like the government. But here's what makes this exciting. When you look under the hood, you find that things are much more complex. The public had a favorable view of 12 out of 13 well-known federal agencies. And some agencies, like the National Park Service, got a huge thumbs up. A majority agreed that federal employees are competent, hard workers doing important public service and improving their communities. And more people said their personal experiences with the federal government were positive than said they were mostly negative. Most importantly, many members of the public associate the federal government with politics. And we all know how people feel about Congress and politicians. When we ask participants to focus on the non-elected employees in career service, their responses were much more positive. We believe this is a key to change. If we can shift the frame and get more people to see government as filled with hardworking, community-oriented individuals who work together to help people rather than as some faceless bureaucracy, which is obviously it is not, we believe we can have a meaningful impact toward increasing trust. That's what we at the partnership are focused on in the coming year. And that's what we wanna talk about today. The work we all share in changing perceptions and building trust, both within government and among the public, and the great opportunities that lie ahead as we embark on that work. We have a great conversation with some of this year's SAMI's finalists ahead, but first, it is my privilege to welcome one of the most important leaders to the success of our government, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Shalanda Young. Thank you, Max, for that kind introduction and for your leadership. Um, as someone who started their federal career as a career staffer at the National Institutes of Health a little over 20 years ago, uh, I am incredibly lucky to work for a president uh, who values the federal workforce, and you see it in his actions and his words. I can't think of a better way to kick off Public Service Recognition Week than to be with some of our incredible federal public servants who are joining today's panel. It's great to be with here with everyone. One of the best parts of my job as the Office of Management and Budget Director is working with our career team. In my previous role down the street, I saw the talent, the expertise, the dedication of OMB. I wanna thank them for their hard, uh, dedicated work. Um, and I see it up close and personal every day. Our team cares deeply about implementing the president's vision, about supporting federal agencies and about serving the American people and their commitment to public services reflected throughout the federal government. As someone who has worked on Capitol Hill, I'm all too familiar with some of the harmful rhetoric about federal employees. For decades now, the American people have heard about so-called Washington bureaucrats gone rogue. That rhetoric is corrosive. You can understand why trusting government isn't where it used to be, and people hear it all the time. That noise may be out of our control, but we can counter it with amazing stories of public servants getting the job done, which is why the Sammies are so valuable. They shine a light on how the federal government is delivering results for the American people, and that work is driven by federal employees. My own role in public service began after grad school. I talked a little about where I started. I was a presidential management fellow uh, at the National Institutes of Health almost 21 years ago. 
Uh, that led me to the Appropriations Committee after about five years at NIH, where I hope my work there had direct impact on federal employees through our legislative proposals and by fighting back, frankly, uh, corrosive uh, proposals that often sought um, to, to use federal employees and our benefits and your benefits um, uh, as bargaining tools. Uh, now at OMB, I get to work with an amazing team that is committed to serving the American public. We're using all the tools we have to meet the president's commitment to restore and trust in government. You heard Max talk about that. From making evidence-based decisions to keeping improper political interference from undermining the work and ultimately our country. I wanna highlight two ways we're taking, uh, taking on the lack of trust in government at OMB. First, under the leadership of President Biden, we're working to change the way the federal government provides services. We're doing this in part by focusing on life experiences, whether it's an important life transition or someone is hit by an emergency. As a South Louisianian, that one's important to me, something I've seen up close and personal. These are the moments when interactions with the government have a profound impact and I also believe impacts how people view the government. More broadly, the president has directed a government-wide focus on every experience people have when receiving services. Families should not have to navigate a tangled web of government websites, offices, and phone numbers to access the services they depend on. Parents, as I'm a new one, uh, don't care whether a program is ultimately run by HHS, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Labor, or the Housing and Urban Development. They just want to get the help they need for their little ones. That's why OMB has provided funding and talent from teams like the US Digital Service to support projects focusing on de better delivering services for people we serve. And just earlier this month, we announced that we're taking on the paperwork and the long lines and the endless documents that people face when they wanna access government programs. It sounds like a small thing, but it's huge when we uh, talk about how much time people have to devote uh, to seeking government services. This is all part, part of this president's effort to deliver better customer experiences to the American people, including communities that are often underserved. All too often, the people who need help the most have the hardest time getting it, and that's what we're working to change. Second, we're investing in our federal workforce. We know that the federal government's single most important asset is its workforce. That's why the very first priority in the president's management agenda is to strengthen and empower the federal workforce. We're working to recruit, retain, and support talent who can help us meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. That means making every federal job a good job, where all employees have opportunities to learn, grow, and thrive throughout their careers. We're also building a roadmap to the future of federal work informed by lessons from the pandemic and nationwide workforce and workplace trends. And we are building the personnel system and support required to sustain the federal government as a model employer able to effectively deliver on a broad range of agency missions. Providing services that meet pe meets people's needs with a focus on their experience. Strengthening the number one asset of the federal government. These are two of the best ways we can restore trust in government. We've seen what a lack of trust in government and our institution looks like. This work is imperative for the president, for me, and for our country, and frankly, the world. And it's made possible because of federal employees. While this week we're focused on recognizing public service, it's important we do this all year round. There are millions across the country who have chosen to serve at the federal, state, and local level. They're discovering new treatments, fighting back wildfires, protecting our safety, as Max pointed out, working out our federal lands, and teaching our children, and they are not thanked enough. So thanks to all of you who serve, thanks to the partnership for lifting these stories, and let's keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Director Young, thank you for the wonderful comments and for all the very, very important work that you're doing. It's very exciting to hear, and uh, it's tremendous that, as you said, you started as a, a career civil servant and are keeping um, your, your eye on the ball and, and trying to help uh, make sure our government can serve the public in, in such important ways. Um, so uh, I'm pleased now to introduce our panel uh, discussion for the day. Our moderator is Managing Editor for Politics, Policy, and Polling at Axios, and a CNN political analyst, Margaret Taleb. Congratulations as well. I saw 
uh, Axios uh, deservedly uh, recognized at the White House Correspondents' Dinner um, this past weekend. Uh, joining her are four of this year's Sammy's finalists, amazing, amazing, amazing civil servants, beginning with Mitch Zeller, just retired after years as the director of FDA's Office of Tobacco Products, where he was instrumental in the fight to reduce access to tobacco products for young people. We have Kyle Armstrong, who is a former uh, FBI special agent whose team helped to crack down on terrorist financing plots using Bitcoin wallets, often to defraud unsuspecting Americans. We also have Bob Fenton, who is the Region 9 Administrator for FEMA based in California, and the former acting FEMA Administrator who oversaw the implementation of mass COVID-19 vaccination sites that served millions of Americans, including me. Thank you. And the efforts to assist Afghan nationals who were evacuated from Kabul. And then finally, we have Hillary Ingraham, who's the director of the Refugee Processing Center at the State Department. She and her team, working with local agencies, resettled more than 70,000 Afghans and helped them start a new life here in America. Thank you all for being here. Margaret, take it away. Oops, thank you so much. Uh, Max, it's great to be here uh, with all of you and looking forward to our conversation today. Um, Mitch, I would like to start with you. Uh, if I can, you've dedicated the last 30 years inside and outside government uh, to tobacco control and regulation. And, and I just think of so much that's happened over the last 30 years, even as recently as the last week or two, uh, when we heard of the big announcement uh, of plans finally to prohibit menthol. Um, I wanted to start at the beginning with you. Why did you first get interested in the issue of tobacco regulation and how did it end up becoming your life's work? It was an easy public health issue to turn to because it's the leading cause of completely preventable disease and death in the country and in the world. And that's with amazing progress that's been made over the last half century in reducing consumption and prevalence of tobacco products. Nonetheless, it, the conservative estimate is about 480,000 avoidable deaths every year in the United States, primarily because of the use of combustible products like cigarettes. I had dedicated my career to working on FDA related issues and this summer would have been 40 years that I was working on FDA issues. But my career really took a, a turn in 1994 when I had an opportunity to oversee an investigation of the tobacco industry by FDA to see if FDA could assert jurisdiction over tobacco products. And that two and a half year journey was life changing. Um, we saw what the tobacco industry was admitting privately that they were denying publicly. We saw how scientists were being treated by the tobacco industry, recruited purportedly to come in to work on harm reduction, only to see all the research scuttled. And the last 28 years of my career have just been a, a labor of love, um, more than 20 of those years uh, at FDA. Uh, and wouldn't trade a day of it. You decided at one point to leave the government and to do the advocacy uh, on the private sector or the nonprofit side. Can you talk a little bit about that decision? And then you decided to go back into government at, at another point. Sure. Um, in 2000, uh, the litigation that the tobacco industry had brought against FDA challenging our assertion of jurisdiction uh, was ultimately decided by the Supreme Court. And in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court agreed with the tobacco industry that FDA's assertion of jurisdiction was unlawful. And with that, I had to shut down the program that I had started. The only way that I could continue working on tobacco was to leave government. I still had a, an SES position at FDA, but I could not have continued to work on tobacco. So I left. And I went to an organization called the American Legacy Foundation, uh, which was recently started as a result of the master settlement agreement by 46 state lawsuits against the tobacco industry. And it was an opportunity for me to stay in the game. Uh, it took Congress nine years to put FDA back in the business of regulating tobacco products. I always felt that personally and professionally, I had unfinished business at FDA. And in late 2012, I had the opportunity to begin discussions with folks in the Obama administration 
And we had a hypothetical discussion about what would it take for me to come back to uh, FDA. And to pick, on, pick up on some of the points that have been made, uh, I left the private sector. I took a 50% salary cut. So I was not coming back for the money. I came back for the opportunity to use the tools of product regulation to make a difference in, the, in reducing the death and disease from the leading cause of, 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 of death and disease in the country, and that is tobacco use. Uh, I remember back early at the beginning of the Obama administration uh, when he signed, um, I guess, an order. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but it, it, but it went to exactly what you're talking about, to regulation. Uh, I remember it because I asked him about it, and he was not amused when I asked him about it. But it did, it did seem like after so many years, uh, the regulation of tobacco was kind of going to come front and center again. And over the last decade, are you surprised with how much has been accomplished? I'm not. Uh, and this sort of goes to the heart of recognizing public service. I'm not surprised because of the remarkable dedication of the people of the Food and Drug Administration, and not just in the Center for Tobacco Products, but the career people and the political leadership, even in the Trump administration, uh, in the commissioner's office uh, and uh, elsewhere. There has been tremendous support for the principle of tobacco product regulation. That doesn't mean that we always got the support that we needed for individual policies. Uh, but I am not surprised that uh, the center was built from nothing and is now a thriving, fully stood up uh, operation uh, about, about 12, almost 13 years after the legislation passed. Were you ever a smoker yourself? When I was in summer camp, Matt Halpern and I, he got a pack of Marlboro. And we went into the woods, not on one day, but on two consecutive days to try to successfully smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and we were unsuccessful. We coughed and we gagged. And that, that's, that, was, that was my only experience with cigarettes. Did your parents smoke? Did you grow up with tobacco around you? Yeah, my parents were heavy smokers. Um, the first Surgeon General's report on smoking and health was in 1964. I was seven years old. I don't remember the Surgeon General's report, but uh, that was when the adult smoking rate was about 44%, almost one in two adults in the United States smoked. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. We made ashtrays for our parents in arts and crafts class. Uh, this was not tobacco growing country. This was Flatbush, Brooklyn. Tobacco use, cigarette smoking was so ingrained in the culture. Um, houses had a bowl of loose cigarettes in the foyer as a welcoming gesture for friends coming over. Um, and so I watched the toll that cigarette smoking took on, especially on my mother, who was never able to quit. My dad was able to quit uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and what we've seen for cigarette smoking, at least over the last 40 or 50 years, is remarkable denormalization of this. No more bowls of loose cigarettes. And I, I doubt in Brooklyn, New York, the kids are still making ashtrays and arts and crafts class for their parents. No, I, I doubt that too very much. Uh, it does certainly, like society's approach to smoking has changed. Um, government at all levels of government, whether it's you know local laws, what happens on airplanes, all of that has changed. But I do want to ask you, how much? Like, what's the chicken and what's the egg? Was it easier for regulators to? restrict tobacco use because societal norms had changed or did societal norms change because of the work that you and regulators have done? That, that's a great question. And I don't think that there's a definitive answer. I'll, I'll give my theory. Uh, it goes back to that notion of states being the laboratories of democracy. Uh, many of the policies that were put in place, clean indoor air laws, raising excise taxes, those all started at the state and local level. Um, and I think those things contributed to the denormalization, especially of cigarette smoking over the last 40 or 50 years. I think that what happened at the state level helped soften the ground for things like bans on smoking on airplanes, uh, both domestically and uh, internationally. There wasn't a lot of tobacco product regulation going on at the state and local level. But I think that when Congress saw fit to put FDA back in the business of, to, of regulating tobacco products in 2009, the legislation passed both chambers with overwhelming bipartisan support. I think it's because of decades of denormalization, some policy change 
at the state and local level. And the time was right for the federal government to be put back in the role of being that gatekeeper, standing between companies making deadly and addictive products and kids and other consumers of those products. There still needed to be the political will to enact the legislation, but in 2009, as I said, it passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, Mitch, I'm gonna ask you one more question, then I'm gonna to move to uh, some of our other panelists, but I wanna ask you to stay with us uh, if you would. Um, I guess my question is, uh, uh, looking forward now, I know you've just retired like a minute ago, but um, what is left to do in terms of um, tobacco regulation? What do you see as the most pressing threat or a bit of unfinished business? And setting tobacco aside, there are other addictive substances or dangerous substance, substances uh, kind of um, in the world of consumer products, I guess. What do you see as kind of the next tobacco? I'll start with that last question, uh, and it comes back to the issue of, of political will. I mean, what is going to happen uh, legislatively with the decriminalization of marijuana use? Um, what is the future of regulation of CBD? I think these are open public health questions. They relate to addiction. They relate to the role of FDA. Uh, and, and what is Congress going to do as a, a legislative matter? Uh, on the, uh, the prospects for tobacco product regulation, I think one major piece of unfinished business is um, cigarettes don't have to be as addictive as they are. They are purposely designed to create and sustain addiction. FDA has a regulatory tool known as the Product Standard Authority that could establish a maximum amount of nicotine in the most harmful of tobacco products, which is cigarettes and other combustible products. The science is there to support that. Is there political will to render cigarettes as we know them, minimally or non-addictive? FDA has done modeling and published the modeling results in the New England Journal over time this would avoid millions of deaths, not, not millions of cases of illness, millions of deaths, because future generations of kids who would experiment with cigarettes would not become addicted. And about 90% of all adults who smoke started smoking as kids. The tobacco industry in an earlier era had identified children and adolescents as replacement smokers for addicted adults who died or quit. Now we can't stop future generations of kids from engaging in risky behavior. But what if the cigarette that they could experiment with was no longer capable of creating or sustaining addiction? I think that's one major piece of unfinished business that I know remains under discussion in the Biden administration and the science is there to support uh, that policy. Mitch Zeller, thank you so much. Okay, stick with us. Um, I'd like to uh, to turn to Kyle Armstrong. Kyle, um, thank you also for joining us. I just have to say, like, I, reading all of your stories as I prepared for this, um, you see the headlines, they're over in a day. When you really sit down and, and take into account what all of you guys have been working on, um, in some cases publicly, in some cases very much behind the scenes until there's a moment for an announcement, like it's it's really quite extraordinary stuff. Um, Kyle, you were the former uh, supervisory special agent uh, to the FBI who led some of the biggest in history cryptocurrency related investigations that um, led to the unraveling of major terrorist financing campaigns that involved ISIS, Al Qaeda, Hamas. Uh, some of these schemes uh, involved soliciting um, cryptocurrency donations that were supposedly for charities. One scheme uh, involved setting up a website selling face masks uh, early in the um, pandemic when people were desperate to get face masks. Um, it was actually a front for ISIS, it turned out. To be able for you and the multi-agency task force that worked on this, to be able to do this, you had to actually be an expert in Bitcoin, in understanding blockchain, in understanding terrorist financing. And I feel like that's um, that's not really a subject of broad common knowledge. Um, how did you get educated? How did you prepare yourself to be able to develop the tools that you needed to do this? And was it like strategic and purposeful or did you just kind of in the process of doing your job realize that this was something you had to learn? Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, very flattering. Thanks for uh, for hosting here today. 
Um, in terms of sort of the overall illicit finance, I had been, you know, working illicit finance with the FBI. Uh, I was there for about 14 years uh, doing mostly illicit finance to include money laundering, terrorism finance, fraud investigations. And so as uh, cryptocurrency really started to, um, to sort of uh, uh, take over a larger proportion of our money laundering, terrorism finance, and fraud schemes, you just had to learn it. And so I think um, uh, the public would be very pleased if they knew the depth of um, knowledge and expertise within the US government. And broadly speaking, I was able to, to work with a lot of the best experts you know, in the world that are in the US government. And so the, the team that we had um, that worked not only these terrorism cases, some money laundering cases, but uh, weapons proliferation, uh, North Korean uh, weapons proliferation, sanctions evasion, some really, really cutting edge individuals um, worked you know, from 10 different agencies uh, on the teams that we were on. And so as, as I, I took over our uh, terrorism financing unit for the FBI and you know, a, a key sort of feature that we had was, was working with our intelligence community, our military community, uh, foreign governments, frankly, and just the best people in the United States government from IRS and Treasury and Homeland Security and FBI and then our, our stellar prosecutors and DOJ prosecutors all sort of working together and um, identifying some of these schemes and figuring out what tools working with uh, private partners um, like you know, TRM Labs and others um, to develop the best way to disrupt these schemes. And so you sort of just develop the expertise. I started working uh, some virtual currency cases in about 2017. And so you just continue to work and you, you, you know, sort of learn on the job and with these other experts from these other agencies, uh, again, some of the, the smartest people in the world. Take us back in history a little bit. You mentioned 2017. At, at, what, point, um, at what point did uh, federal investigators realize that um, the blockchain, that crypto uh, were going to become and were becoming new venues? And why is that easier to hide than just cash or tr traditional financing mechanisms? Well, those are great questions. So, you know, with the, the advent, the rollout of Bitcoin uh, in 2009-ish, 2010, um, you know, there was a large proportion of uh, virtual currency transactions that, um, that we were working were related to dark net, um, marketplaces, drug sales, things like that. And so Silk Road was the first major darknet marketplace that was a multi-agency group, again, in a similar fashion between DEA and FBI and HSI and, and others. Um, and in 2013, the federal government, you know, uh, took that site down. Um, there was, uh, there were 177,000 Bitcoin, which were seized and forfeited. And that was really sort of a, a broad um, attention grabbing situation for a lot of folks that um, the, the size of this uh, darknet marketplace, again, mostly focused on drugs. There were some other illicit items, but that really sort of um, triggered um, sort of a warning because at, at that point there were so few folks that knew how to, to do these investigations. As you move forward, um, you know, again, in 2013, 2015, you start to see a few cases here and there that involved uh, virtual currency, mostly, largely Bitcoin, but fraud schemes um, started to really pick up with virtual currency. Um, investment schemes started to pick up with virtual currency. And so you just sort of dive in. By 2017, my first exposure was a money laundering case where there had been some um, I uh, healthcare fraud, which uh, the subject then took that money, put into virtual currency in order to launder the proceeds. And as that's happening, um, you sort of found out uh, there was this broader network of, of third parties who are willing to engage in um, transactions uh, anonymously, which is, you know, violates uh, several uh, sections of the Bank Secrecy Act and uh, potentially some uh, federal uh, criminal code. 
And after, after sort of securing um, a, a landscape view of what was going on, then you start to get more involved. And that's what happened with uh, myself and our team. Um, I left uh, working cases and went to manage cases at FBI headquarters in our, our money laundering unit, uh, which had housed the, the virtual currency evolving threat team, our, our best virtual currency folks in the FBI. I program managed that unit for a couple of years. And that's really where uh, we st I started to get in um, working basically full time on money laundering and virtual currency based investigations. Uh, and, and around 2018 was really where we started to focus on that and see some of these big cases, um, you know, huge dollar amounts and uh, Iranian, Russian, North Korean. Uh, Venezuela and some actual nation state involvement in some of these cases where, um, you know, there were a, a lot of dark corners in the virtual currency realm that we were trying to highlight. And so uh, as a, a opposed to cash, to be honest, um, cash is much harder to track than virtual currency. And so there are, um, with most virtual currencies, there's a public immutable blockchain and every transaction ever consummated is available to look at on that public blockchain. Your US dollars, when you pull out your US dollar and you look, you look at that serial number, um, no one tracks that. You know, the Federal Reserve may have some tracking systems, but um, cash is, is difficult to track, more difficult, I think, than virtual currency. And as technology catches up, again, some of these blockchain Intel companies um, where I subsequently left the FBI uh, about four weeks ago and joined one um, because that's where sort of the cutting edge and, and the fight is in, in tracking and publishing illicit transactions in the virtual currency space. So you're being uh, celebrated uh, here for the like undeniably important accomplishments that, that you and colleagues um, you know, worked on over the last several years, but I was going to ask uh, how much of the fight do you think is, is behind you and or the government and how much is still ahead? Is, is the problem solved? Did the task force uh, do work that unraveled everything and no one can ever uh, illicitly raise uh, money through cryptocurrency again? Or what does the challenge look like going forward? Uh, another great question. And unfortunately, you know, the, the problem was not solved. And um, our, our strike force that we worked on, again, it was composed of um, real, real, uh, a lot of the real brain power in, in and around the DC area. And several of us have left government. And one of the primary reasons, I think, I know for myself, for others, um, uh, colleagues, Working at the government, um, of course, you have uh, broad exposure to a number of things, but working in the uh, private sector at blockchain Intel firms, which a few of us have, my colleague Chris Chancheski from the IRS also works at TRM, um, we, are, we have more tools at our disposal, and I think we're able to more easily and effectively amplify some of the disruptions. So instead of us working on one case, you know, 10 of the best folks working on one case, um, we work on 10 each and we work on underlying investigations to help a hundred law enforcement agencies. So uh, we're trying to, I think, effectively teach people to fish, so to speak, uh, for a, a, a tired um, uh, analogy. We have uh, folks that are uh, law enforcement agencies, regulators who are still learning um, the, the mechanism for regulation, for investigation, for uh, coming regulations. And so we're able to sort of take our experience and push that to, uh, to folks in law enforcement, in government uh, across the United States and to, to local state partners in order to get them up to speed, because there's at this point, there is too much work for a small handful of folks at these agencies to do. And so one of, one of the statistics I saw right before I left, uh, looking at fraud schemes, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC has put out some pretty good information about the uh, amount of even just fraud schemes, such as romance fraud, that involved virtual currency. And it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. 
And so uh, what we need to do, and I think it was difficult at government if you are focusing on the cases, is to push out that, um, that knowledge base and that expertise to others. And so one of the things we are doing is working with dozens of law enforcement, dozens of regulators, governments across the West, frankly, to push out that expertise as to how to identify and mitigate illicit finance um, in, in the same sort of uh, spheres of terrorism finance, money laundering, fraud. Um, and, and, and so that's one, uh, one way that we've been able to do it. I know myself, uh, Jesse Brooks was one of our wonderful prosecutors. Um, Leah Faruqi, our, our sort of our lead prosecutor and the lead of the team and others from the team have continued to sort of try and shine a, a light a little bit on um, some of the tools that are available to uh, to people to fight illicit finance. So it sounds like what you're saying is uh, when you think about um, public service, when you think about uh, the crypto uh, related investigations going forward, that there is um, there is sort of a real public private um, role for collaboration because a lot of the talent coming into government or working with government uh, has come from the outside and a lot of people who have been in government can have some more flexibility outside. Uh, obviously when you're in government, you have the ability, you have access to certain information um, uh, and, and a more investigative role. But when it comes to the developing technology, some of that has to come from laboratories on the outside. That's absolutely right. And you know, the, the good thing is we are in good hands. Um, when in 2017, when we were, our group was sort of forming in an informal group of, of finding some of the best people. Um, it, it was a much smaller talent pool across, uh, across law enforcement and regulators. At this point, the talent pool is much bigger. And so we have uh, folks at all of um, uh, federal agencies that, that investigate you know, um, money laundering and fraud, any of the, the, the normal illicit finance that you would think about. And there are people that are coming in. Luckily, you know, you have um, college graduates coming in who have been using electronic payment systems, and uh, they're much more familiar with with virtual currency than I know that I was as uh, a 15 year bureaucrat at the at the FBI. And so, there's a little more um, just sort of knowledge base that that we're recruiting from into the FBI, into the IRS, HSI, Treasury, things like that. And so, you know, we'll, we'll catch up. It just takes some of that collaboration. And again, great people working hard, which I think we have in spades at the federal government. Kyle, thanks so much. Uh, stick with us uh, if you can. And uh, Bob Fenton, I would love to turn the conversation to you. You are FEMA's administrator for Region 9. Uh, I think uh, right as our call was starting, you said that spans across like five time zones or some eight time zones, something like yeah. that. Um, but so you are the administrator for Region 9, but I think we know you better in the last couple of years as the former acting FEMA administrator and as the guy who ran the uh, enormous uh, task of Operation Allies Welcome to Resettle uh, Afghans. So um, let's leave Region 9 aside for just one second. I want to uh, start by asking you about these two completely different but completely massive assignments. Your first one um, as acting FEMA administrator was essentially to lead, to organize the initiative that created a mass model for federal vaccination sites. So this was um, about 9,000 people, around $5 billion. Um, this was every state, every territory in the country, uh, an emphasis on underserved communities and marginalized communities. Um, when you got tapped for that task, did you have like a total of panic attack? And how did you think about um, how not to fail disastrously and how you might actually succeed? Like, how did you literally approach the task? Yeah, well, I've worked for FEMA for 26 years now and uh, had the option, uh, had the um, history of responding to many big events in our country's history, 9-11, uh, Katrina, and a number of other events. I would say the pandemic is the largest event uh, that I've uh, responded to and has caused the most impact to the U.S. Um, taking this job on as the acting administrator of FEMA, this is my second time now doing it. Uh, I did it also in transition from 
Obama to the Trump administration and now from uh, the Trump to Biden administration. Um, I came into it uh, maybe uh, having done it once before, uh, kind of ready for um, some of the priorities that may be coming from the president uh, to FEMA uh, and knew that, uh, you know, we were in a battle uh, against COVID and that um, the vaccine had just come out in December. Um, so as we went to January, uh, FEMA had already taken a big role in some of the uh, protection measures before then uh, and some of the increases of uh, medical staff at hospitals and those kind of things. And I kind of, uh, as I was looking forward, uh, started talking to the administration as the transition happened and realized that, you know, one of the big priorities for FEMA was going to be to ensure that we have vaccinated America. And so FEMA uh, is a, a great organization, uh, but uh, you know, I think where we get our ability from is working across government, state, local, uh, private sector, nonprofit, and the public. And when you leverage all of America and make it a whole of America effort, you're able to accomplish some of the things that we're able to do uh, in the short time period we're able to do that with regard to vaccinating America. Logistically, what was the biggest challenge? And, um, and then beyond the logistics, like, I guess, message-wise, what do you think was the biggest challenge? I think the, the biggest challenge, um, you know, one of the priorities was uh, of the administration was a focus on equity. And, and so one of the biggest challenges was explaining in your discussion about trust uh, was where to put vaccination sites that ensured uh, equitable distribution of vaccination, but more importantly, that we we're reaching the most socially vulnerable uh, first. And so uh, communicating that to elected local leaders, to the public of uh, the rationale reason for uh, where we established sites uh, was number one, how we communicate that. And I, one of the things I think that I've learned over time in, uh, in, in, in responding to incidents is regardless of how much you communicate, it's not going to be enough. So leverage every platform that exists, whether it be social media, speaking uh, to elected local leadership, speaking to the public, uh, leverage everything you can to communicate uh, what the strategy is and, and why you're doing it. And we knew that, uh, you know, that uh, those that were uh, Latino and African-American uh, were being hospitalized twice as much as others uh, by COVID. So it became a natural priority to start focusing on those populations and the most social vulnerable populations in the United States first. And to be able to explain this and communicate this across uh, all levels was important to uh, ensure people understood why we were making that a prioritization. Uh, then the next step was, uh, you know, how to uh, get out uh, to these areas and, and do this, uh, leveraging the military, leveraging uh, Coast Guard, leveraging uh, multiple federal agencies from the Forest Service to other federal agencies that we worked with uh, and disasters, we brought them all underneath an umbrella and eventually established 37 sites across uh, 27 states. But then what we found out really quickly is we established these max vaccination sites. It wasn't going to be sufficient to really reach the populations that the president wanted us to reach, which was most socially vulnerable, because they weren't necessarily always coming to those large sites. So what we did is establish 1,600 mobile sites uh, that allowed us to go into communities uh, and service uh, those populations where they were. And it helped with some of the trust. Some of the ways we did this was build relationships with community leaders, uh, whether it be faith-based leaders, uh, maybe uh, political leaders in the community, uh, but uh, build those relationships to do that. One of the places, uh, for example, near me that we put a mass vaccination site was the Oakland Coliseum. Uh, we chose a lot of sports venues because people knew where they were uh, and uh, people had trust to go to that site and plus it was in a uh, social vulnerable area. Uh, so uh, we uh, went ahead and, and chose that site. But then what we did is we worked with community leaders around there and uh, reached out 
to community groups. So we would do something like have a uh, mobile site, maybe go to the community center or maybe a faith base uh, a church or another place to vaccinate people where they felt more comfortable coming to that spot and maybe didn't want to come to the large area. But we looked for those kind of places, make sure there was transportation, make sure there's resources uh, to help those get to those sites to get vaccinated. So it just wasn't by car, but come by foot, but come by public transportation to get there and make sure that we uh, made them feel comfortable and secure uh, when vaccinated. To include talking about um, you know the vaccine and having doctors and others reach out to those that maybe had uh, uh, were skeptical of the vaccine at that time. Um, I want to ask you, Bob, about how you then pivoted to this other enormous task, uh, Operation Allies. Welcome. Uh, it's they're they're parallel in the sense that these were uh, major crises that the U.S. government had to respond to but a completely different population and a completely different set of challenges in terms of uh, taking care of the population and also messaging to the broader American public about the mission. Um, I know some of that's politics and uh, you, you probably want to stay in the logistics lane here, but how did you approach that task and how did it end up being different from the vaccination task? Did, were there lessons from one that applied to the other? Yeah, we use a system in the United States uh, called the National Incident Management System and leveraging that system to help you lead and organize how we operate uh, helps us. And, and since the whole nation uses that system, you can then leverage other federal departments and agencies, state and local governments, and they all understand the terminology and, and how you manage and set up objectives uh, and those kind of things. Uh, Operation Allies Welcome uh, was uh, a very unique event. And after I completed being the acting administrator of FEMA, went home for a couple of months uh, back to California, and they got pulled to DC in August uh, when we all saw uh, Kabul Airport and, and Afghanistan uh, get taken back over by uh, the Taliban. And at that time, we were starting the evacuation of those who uh, work for uh, the U.S. government, those who support the U.S. government, whether it be the military, Department of State, or other organizations, and move them out of Afghanistan. And there's about 10 locations across the Mideast and Europe we had to move them to, and then move them to eight bases in the United States, um, and then onward uh, to uh, communities around the United States, the hundreds of communities, uh, where then we resettled them. Uh, it was a, a huge event where we had hundreds of planes moving individuals and a very complex event um, that required that we make sure that everyone received their age appropriate vaccines to make sure that we took care of individuals with unique medical conditions to make sure that we uh, also communicated to our public uh, that was wondering who are these people? Where are they coming from? How do we ensure that you're not putting someone that's at risk to our community and our community. So having the vetting uh, and, and, uh, and making sure that we vetted everyone that came into our community uh, and do that in a way to ensure that we were ensuring the safety of our community, not only from a medical perspective, uh, uh, perspective of vaccinated individuals, but also who were we letting in. And so I found that, uh, again, this is somewhere where communication uh, is critical and you have to almost over communicate. Uh, so going to talk to congressional members, talk to local government members, to sheriffs, uh, to different organizations. The other key thing was look at organizations uh, much like I did in the vaccination mission that are gonna help you communicate. Uh, and, and so relying on the faith-based organizations and the vaccination mission, you know, medical communities, uh, other community leaders. In this case, uh, I relied on uh, the military, um, you know, veterans from the military that worked with these Afghans that were interpreters, uh, you know, for our military to help me uh, communicate who these individuals were, right? And then put a face on them, who, you know, who are these people? So this is, you know, for example, one of the individuals, and I've had a chance to meet hundreds of Afghans during this operation, was a uh, fighter pilot for the Afghan uh, military and uh, was not able to go back home when this happened, had to evacuate and left his wife and family there. Uh, 
Um, you know, uh, another lady was a uh, uh, an announcer, a uh, public uh, radio announcer. And uh, she had to evacuate because she wouldn't be able to do that job anymore. And she was at risk of being there. And so when I asked her, you know, what do you want to do in the United States? I want to eventually get back to public radio. Where do you want to go? I want to go to Hollywood. Right. And so it's putting a kind of a face and a name on, you know, who we're helping and why we're helping them uh, and trying to explain that and, uh, you know, divert, uh, you know, uh, fear out there and communicate through organizations that help you tell the story of those that we're trying to help is what I uh, relied on uh, to do that mission. Logistically, it was very challenging. Uh, we had uh, you know, thousands of people each day that we were bringing into the United States. We had to bring them in uh, safely. We had to make sure that, uh, especially with COVID and other concerns, that we did that uh, in a way uh, that maintained the safety uh, from a medical standpoint. We had many individuals that had uh, injuries and we had embedded back into the United States. Uh, and so having an organization that could do this, uh, you know, over half of the world uh, in multiple locations uh, and work together collectively was critical. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of great uh, individuals throughout uh, government that I got to work with from Department of State to the Department of Defense uh, that worked all hours to make sure that uh, this happened effectively. Uh, and did so uh, much to the security of the Afghans that you know were allies of ours uh, overseas, but also to ensure the safety of communities throughout the United States. Well, Bob, thank you so much uh, for sharing your story. And of course, uh, we're all watching now as there is a uh, government and private sector effort to resettle um, some Ukrainians who um, of course, have had to leave because of the Russian invasion. So uh, thank you. Thanks to all three of you for sharing your stories. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation back to Max and thanks for letting me be part of it. Thank you for all that wonderful discussion and for your important service to our nation. It really is, uh, gives me hope. Uh, we have so many difficulties as a nation to address and it really is extraordinary public servants that are on the front line to doing it. Before we close, we encourage all of you watching today to join us in celebrating Public Service Recognition Week. You can find resources and tools at psrw.org, and you can read more about our work on trust in government at ourpublicservice.org. Lastly, the Sammy stories you heard here today are just a few of this year's 30 remarkable nominees who each have made vital contributions to making our nation safer, healthier, and more prosperous. Visit servicetoamericamedals.org to learn more about all the nominees and cast your vote in our People's Choice Contest. Thanks for joining us and be sure to thank a public servant today. It's tremendous to have all of you participating. Thank you. Thanks.